Hello, welcome to Sleuthwood. I am so excited to have Wendy Wagner today, um, who we've known for each other you know, on tw Twitter, now Blue Sky, for a while, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, definitely, like, a little before your book came out. Like, okay. I think I found you because Jeff Vandermeer, like, <sighs> was talking about your book because he had an early copy and um so i was like that sounds amazing i gotta find out what this person is doing and then yeah i just <laughs> fell into your gravitational well <laughs> well that's kind of exciting to know <laughs> i feel kind of i feel kind of like a um, celebrity <laughs> you are yeah <laughs> um so you are an author and also an editor. Yeah. Among other things. Yes. Um, so before we get into that, because I want to talk about that a lot, um, what I really want to know is your background. Like, you're not a scientist. And so yeah. how did you come about? So I'm, like, totally a non-science person. Well... I'll kind of take that back. I did think I would want to be a scientist. Uh, when I first started college, I thought I was going to be a chemist. Um, and then I kind of didn't do very well at calculus. And then I went into the the much more lucrative and thrilling fields of philosophy, music, and literature. Um, but yeah, I, um, I've lived in the Pacific Northwest my whole life. Um, I... Uh, always knew well before the age of seven i didn't know i wanted to be a writer but from the age of seven onward i knew i wanted to be a writer um and i've always loved fantasy science fiction mm -hmm. horror that kind of thing so i knew i wanted to write that stuff despite what they told me in college about how like that was stupid <laughs> um yeah and then after college i mucked around with like you know, the a, a wide array of not exciting jobs. Like I made pizza and I sold sheet music, which is something people used to be able to make a living at doing before the internet like really arrived. Um, and yeah, had a kid, um, you know, made ends meet for us for a little while, like folding laundry for someone. I uh, lived with my mom. <laughs> worked at the Portland Children's Museum for a long time. Uh, and then little by little sort of got the confidence to get started writing. And um, then I've just been slogging along in that world ever since. <laughs> was, was there something that happened at age seven or was that just the time you decided that you wanted to start writing? Well, I, it took me a long time to learn how to read. Like I was a slow learner and then it really clicked and I just got really into reading. I should, the background for that information is that we lived in an ultra small town uh, in rural Southern Oregon on the coast. Um, my school had like around 10 kids most of the time I was in it. I was sometimes the only kid in my class. And when I say sometimes, I mean, there were three years that there were other kids in my class. Wow. Um, and every two weeks, the bookmobile would come out. And it was like a big social event for the whole town. I mean, the whole town had about 60 people in it and everybody would come to bookmobile day and it would, they would like park at nine in the morning and they would leave at three, like when school, no, I think they stayed till four maybe. So it would be like, we would be able to get out of class to go and pick out our books and we could be in there as long as we wanted. And I would be in there as long as I could. And it was always good that my mom would pick me up after work, after school on those days, because I would get so many books. I remember one, one summer I was like binging, like that, like, you know, the Nancy Drew and Hardy Boy Chronicle of books. And I got like 125 books and I wow. read them in two weeks because <laughs> we didn't have TV really, right? Like there was an antenna on top of the hill that like it would come in in like speckles or blue and green or like it would not be realistic right. at all. I mean, it was still a treat. I loved it, don't get me wrong, but it was very unreliable and didn't work. So I just read 
a lot because also like we didn't really have any neighbors so it wasn't like i could just go next door and play with the other kids books were kind of my whole world so then like around seven i, I read the, a book that was told in multiple pov characters and i just figured out from this book suddenly it, like i realized like somebody chose how to write this story somebody made decisions like books didn't just grow on trees like somebody made them and that was just like ah, in my head you know it was like <laughs> and that was like what changed everything it was just like okay that's what i'm gonna do obviously if you get to do that then that's what i'm gonna do <laughs> <laughs> i like that i like that that's a great story um <laughs> so so southern oregon coast um the uh, the landscape obviously must uh, of course not having tv too must have influenced you a lot yeah, yeah, it was a, a huge part of just like being in the world for me. I was um, like from a very early age, I was obsessed with animals because before we moved to Oregon, my parents actually like had like a ranch in Eastern Washington. Like what a difference. Like we lived in like the desert of Eastern Washington and then wind up moving to the Oregon coast, right? Where we, we got like 90 inches of rain a year. Um, wow. But they were like so busy with like this family business that was of course at the time really, they went through a lot of struggles. I mean, in like 1982, like the price of wheat crashed throughout the world and like farmers were going broke. My parents lost tons of money in that. And then like my dad, he kept sheep and like there was this new disease that broke out globally um, called like white U disease, which is kind of like HIV, but for sheep. Mm -hmm. So like they were very stressed out and not around very much. And my sisters took care of me, but they were in high school, so they weren't around much. So it was like me and an assembled cast of like animals all the time. Like they'd be like, okay, you just go out in the yard with the horse or like, <laughs> you know, we always had like during like lamb season, like my mom would like raise all the lambs who's like moms had a problem. So like sometimes there'd be like 30 baby sheep in the house and those were like my buddies to play with. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I just um, kind of like had a stronger affinity for animals and for people because of that, I think. So as a kid, I was like, always like, I just want to be around the animals. <laughs> and yeah, it was really important. <laughs> that's it. That's amazing. Were you right on the coast or you kind of inland a little bit? We're in, we were, we were kind of inland, like in the coastal mountain range. Okay, okay. Yeah. So like really steep valleys yeah. be like dark until nine in the morning and then get dark at like seven even though it's summertime so it should have been like light all day you know it's very very um very gloomy in a lot of ways i think uh it and it was a logging central area right so um but it was also like where we lived was a kind of a weird mix of hippies and loggers and yeah it was just kind of a weird place to grow up i think just just in general very strange well i'm shocked you became a horror author <laughs> <laughs> well it's kind of a, a hilarious side note about being a kid there so uh the road from like the real town where you had to go to get groceries to our house was extremely treacherous like it's 25 miles long uh you know to get from our house to the grocery store and at one point you're like driving in this canyon and it's just like a narrow two-lane road that's just extremely windy and it's just a sheer drop off um you know at points it's like you, there's like nothing down there it's just like a cliff and trees and it's just like what is down there or you're right next to like this raging stretch of like this like creek that would flood or stuff it was and there were always accidents there were always like log trucks whipping by it was everybody we knew had had a car accident on that wow. you know road and um and then of course there was tons and tons of roadkill and when when I was in second grade, my best friend actually died in like a, in an accident, not in a car accident, um, but he, I became extremely goth after that. <laughs> and I got like really obsessed with like 
anytime I found roadkill, I would have to bury it. So like that was like my childhood mission was burying like little dead animals whenever I found them. The biggest thing I ever buried was a deer, but that was not a very good burial because of course I wasn't like borrowing like the shovel or anything. <laughs> it was very inept, but you know, also gross, but <laughs> kind. I, I like to think of it as being kind. <laughs> When I think about that stuff, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you were probably destined for this <laughs> world. Yeah, I, you had no choice. <laughs> yeah. That's fascinating. And so now you live in Portland, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. In the little, well, technically, I live in a suburb of Portland, but it's like three mile walk to Portland. Oh, I, I lived, I lived just like when I, when I lived down there, I lived about like half a mile just outside i was like in lake oswego but I just went, on the other side yeah, of the yeah. line i went to the college there and so i just i, I oh. mostly just walked and like but the nice. college was in portland but i lived in lake oswego so it's kind of yeah <laughs> I, well it's so pretty out there yeah yeah um so how do you like portland compared to where you've been i mean sometimes i still pine for the coast right like it gets in you but i mean i've lived in portland basically since 1995, right? Like I moved to go to college in Forest Grove, um, which is just outside of Portland. And I don't know, it's just kind of stuck in my craw. And it's just home. It's I'm used to it. I like it. There's a lot of wonderful things here. Yeah. Yeah. No, I grew up um, in Camas right across the river. Oh, wow. So yeah. Um, I haven't been down there quite a while though. <laughs> But yeah, no, Portland was definitely my, my stomping ground when I was young. Um, and in the Columbia River Gorge, too. Yeah, so, that's so great. Yeah. Have you you've probably been up there a bit, haven't you? Yeah, a little yeah. bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's talk about let's talk about your work. So you you do a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm kind of overwhelmed. So you write a lot of short stories and you've written four, five, five coming out, your fifth one's coming yeah, out? Yeah, my fifth book is going to come out in 2025. Okay. And then you also um, do a lot of editing. You're editor-in-chief at Nightmare Magazine, is that right? Right, yeah. And I'm the senior and managing editor at Lightspeed, which is like okay. um, a science fiction magazine. Okay. Yeah. And Nightmare is horror, right? Right. Okay, okay. So I want to ask you about your books because I was looking at your books. I haven't read them yet, and I have um, them on my wish list. But the, um, what's it called? Star Spawn <laughs> caught my attention because tentacles. Right? I love tentacles. I don't I don't know if you can see, but like I have like this like skull with like a sea anemone. Oh, has, like yeah. all this tide pool stuff. I yeah. love sea stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the first real novel projects that I ever, well, I mean, I'd written novels, but nothing had happened to them. I wrote tie-in fiction for um, a game called Pathfinder, which is a lot like Dungeons and Dragons, okay. right? So I wrote some short fiction for them and it was successful and they invited me to write some novels. And that's, it's a fun, but kind of grueling process to write tie-in fiction like that because you're working with a team, you're like, everything has to be approved to make sure it works with the rules of the game and stuff. Um, so I had two books with them. The first one was like, I totally came up with like, you know, I, I did like a pitching process. I took like the character that had been in one of my short stories and like came up with some adventures for her. And then the second book, they were like, we want to do another book with that character. Um, but we were thinking we have a product coming out that's going to be about like Lovecraftian sea monstery things. And we kind of have a rough idea for what a story could be. And we'd like you to turn it into a novel. So that's what Star Spawn was, right? Like, so it's, it was fun because obviously I, get, one of the things we have down here in Portland is the HP Lovecraft Film Fest, right? And I try to go like almost every year. It's always a blast. I've written tons of short fiction that's like set in like HP Lovecraft's world. So it was like, oh, this will be a total blast. But it's also like it was kind of a hard project because it's kind of like the I'm writing a novel to work with rules and creatures that are inspired by H.P. Lovecraft, but for a product that was still in production. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're like, 
So you have to have a plot. It has to work with the rules, but the rules haven't been made up yet. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, I'm just going to try to pack in as much like sea stuff that I enjoy. So like, I just watched like several times. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen, there's a documentary about like James Cameron and the making of Titanic. I, like it's about him, like taking these like really cool deep sea gizmos to go explore the wreck of the Titanic. So I just like watch that like in slow motion and be like, okay, this is what wood looks like when it's been under the water for this long. This is what, you know, and that, cause the whole story of Starspawn is like set, like it's like this island that had sunk beneath the sea. And then like, there's like a volcanic event and it comes to the surface. So it's like, Ooh, I'm going to have all these like places that have been like rotting under the sea. And I'm going to like, it's going to be so cool. <laughs> And it was, in fact, like describing the setting was, uh, it was the highlight of that project. Like, I kind of wish I could like write another book in that setting, but like all my own stuff, just because I right. don't want to write about, you know, submerged cities <laughs> and put in like, you know, dying fish flopping all over the place because right. they got stranded or whatever. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, so fun. So you, you mentioned you tattooed just now, and then also your... Um wanting to put in a bunch of sea creatures. So you must obviously have an interest in sea creatures. Yeah, well, I mean, I grew up on the Oregon coast. Right, right. I, I grew I even like took marine biology in high school. Mm. I just I just love being on the coast, looking in like tide pools and things like that. It's just like so neat. I don't really know much about like authentically about sea beings, but I enjoy learning. <laughs> But it's great. I mean, you 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 don't have to know a lot. You, you like observe them and been inspired by them, and now want to put them in books and get tattoos of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just I like that we don't have to know everything about it, especially in like a fictional or creative mindset. I like that we can yeah. just like take those things, and we don't have to know every intricate detail of a sea anemone. We can like yeah. use that information and like process it and create you know different creatures. And I like that process. Yeah, me too. It's. It's really, really satisfying and fun and gives me like a great excuse to like tap into like my natural curiosity and like, I just want to be learning my whole life. And this is, gives me like a great outlet for like, here's what to do with all the things I just learned. Like, it's like, oh, I went to Astoria and I toured this cannery where they talked about like this cannery museum where they talked about the life of people and like, you know, turn of the century Astoria and how they fished. I'm like, that's going to be a short story. And it was. <laughs> there's a great, there's a great um, museum in Astoria. It's a, um, the um, Maritime Museum. Yeah, that one's so cool. I like that. I was really inspired. They had a, um, a, a shipwreck exhibit. Yeah. Which I found fascinating. It was just so fascinating. Um, I still have ideas processing about that, too. <laughs> That's great. I love that. Um, yeah. So your, your newer books, after those two, um, a lot of those were set on the coast, yeah? Yeah, yeah, actually. Um, let's see. So... I had one science fiction novel that's set on another world, and then I kind of was done with science fiction because it was kind of, I don't know, sometimes it can be a pain in the butt. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so then I just really dove into horror. And so I, I have the one novel is set in, it's essentially written in like the town where I went to high school. <laughs> it's about the area where I grew up, but I've given them all new names and, uh, creepy backstories uh that one's called the deer kings and it's it's about it's kind of it's two timelines so there's like the stuff about these people when they were kids growing up in the late 80s so very much drawing on like my own experience um and then the one character his wife gets a job as high school principal so he has to come back to this town that he never wanted to come back to and he discovers that uh, well uh, that a lot has changed in the town but some things still remain like the town still struggles economically and he also discovers that like this supernatural being that he and his friends like brought to life to protect them when they were kids being tormented by like a his neighbor who was a drug dealer uh the town has like kept it alive and like turned it into like the basis of a cult 
and they're like, oh, well, our cult is all fueled off of like, we get stuff if we make sacrifices and what would be the best possible sacrifice than like to sacrifice the person that like created this creature. <laughs> so like they come after him and his family. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> yeah. And it, it was also fun because, you know, when I don't know what it's like on the coast anymore, but or how it is in a lot of, I, I don't think it's quite the same as it was in the 90s, but people were really gung-ho about like high school football when mm -hmm. I was a young person. And I, I love the book, like Friday Night Lights. I've only seen like a few episodes of the TV show. It was good. But so I, I was kind of inspired by like some of the like football weirdness to like, that's part of like what's, going on with the town as well <laughs> i like that. i like that the, the setting is so personal it felt really good writing it that's great um and your new book which is coming out what's it 2025 yeah so. so that's set closer here to portland it's actually it's set well basically i just kind of took the town of estacada and replaced it with my own made up town <laughs> but it's really inspired by a lot of like the um experiences that i've had like exploring this area and um there's like this long the, the clackamas river here is just like an amazing beautiful river it's stunning um but like there's a lot of dams on the this end of it and so there's like this historically there was a lot of infrastructure that was put in around the turn of the century to like build these dams and there were tent cities that people lived in and uh sort of like doing research on that made me think of like learn also about like you know there's a lot of mining that happened in this area which is funny like you never think about like oregon like when you picture like what a old time mine looks like you're like picturing like something in nevada or montana mm -hmm. and like crusty panhandlers and stuff and not like it was like i can't i don't have a good insight into what a lot of these mining places close by would look like in the time period, but I have visited like um, in the town of Golden down in, in Southern Oregon, like there's actually a ghost town you can go visit and there's a lot of historical like photos and things. And it was like so fascinating to read about. So like taking that stuff and also like watching tons and tons of YouTube videos where like nowadays people are exploring like abandoned mines and it's creepy. Oh my gosh, gross. Um, and that like really kind of uh, provided the setting. Um, like, so you have this historical yuckiness of like what mining can do to a town, to a, a landscape, but also contrasted with like the idea of like every little town now wants to be like the next bend, right? Mm -hmm. Like to be, it's like trying to tap its, its cuteness and its touristy goodness and in this case you know it's like oh this town is like it's going to be like the next next rafting hot spot and all oh, these hikers want to come here and like <laughs> what does that do to a town especially when you have horrible things going on <laughs> yeah it was really fun <laughs> that's that's really interesting my um my grandfather was a miner in montana whoa no way so, yeah he he um in fact he i might not have been here he had he like narrowly missed a mining accident where that like killed everybody else. Like, Holy smokes! He didn't go in that day or something, and then the mine collapsed. So, wow. narrow miss. <laughs> yeah, yikes! What a neat story. So it's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't otherwise be interested in mines so much, but the right. family history is like yeah, that makes it a lot more interesting. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. And they are creepy. I mean, like I get claustrophobic, so the idea of like. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Like, I was like, oh, I should go visit these places. And I was like, no, this is never going to happen. <laughs> I don't even like caves. I mean, I won't even set foot in a cave, so. Oh, man. It's hard for me sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot I of thought... caves here, too. Yeah. Um, so one thing, um, one thing that I've tried to do, I sort of stumbled into it 
actually it, it kind of like there it's uh, the concept kind of whispers into my very first book which is you know it's set in this imaginary world of galarian that belongs to somebody else but i started putting in like real plants and it's just sort of crescendoed and now so it's it's really like my goal when i'm writing these horror novels like nobody just walks into a, a tree they walk into a douglas fir they walk into a cedar they're getting their face slapped by salmon berries you know like i just really believe that for most people plants are like invisible i know like when i was growing up like for up up until a certain amazing thing that had like i went on like my first nature hike where somebody like taught me like this is a hemlock tree and you can identify it by this it was like it opened up the world to me and before that like plants were just this green mush that interfered with my ability to watch animals or like charismatic <laughs> insects and now i'm like really passionate about plants and i love them so much and i just feel like this is my way to kind of like sneak that into you know it's like a scary book and there are monsters and stuff like that but you're also like secretly like really grounding it in like the real plants that exist right. in, in this area i like that i like that because for two reasons one it educates people about like the plant names and what like their properties of you know like salmon berry is not nice to walk into it's prickly no <laughs> it's very prickly <laughs> and and two it like it just really grounds it and gives it a more sense of a bigger sense of place or a more deep sense of place um, yeah yeah i think and i think that sense of place is like really important yeah know? yeah like, I want these books, like if nothing else, to just be like they're real chunks of like what it's like to be in Oregon in a certain kind of place. I just I, I know I get that sense when I'm as a reader when I'm reading yeah. something, and especially if it's something in the Northwest because I'm like oh oh yes Douglas fir I know ah I right? feel it. yeah it's like yeah. you feel so much more connected to it and. If it's somewhere that I don't know, like a, a, a somewhere set in, you know, like England or something, you, you get a sense of place, even though it's not something you've maybe necessarily experienced. So I like that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's this cultural and different, um, um, ge geographical. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's so, I just, it can be so eye opening when people like do try to put in things like, I just only recently learned that like robins in Europe are like these little puffball things with like these like cherry berry bellies that are perfectly round and, and pinky red mm -hmm. versus like our robins. And I was just like, what? It's like a whole different reality over there. They got the they got the cute badgers. They got the the like we're fluffball <laughs> robins and like our our robins and we're like we'll will shiv you, you know, <laughs> like little badass birds compared to those guys. And yeah, so I just really appreciate it when writers put in those little bits mm -hmm. of description and things and like help make other parts of the world like real to me. Yeah. It's so exciting. Our badgers are a bit meaner too. I mean, those are all cute and blind. <laughs> <laughs> right? Ours will not. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> they would definitely like take down those weird badgers no problem <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i don't know which one's better but i like them both <laughs> i do too they're both terrific <laughs> yeah it's, it's funny thinking about like europe versus here because so many of the people who came here were from europe and they named things after things in europe but it's so superficial yeah. like the robins are completely different families right <laughs> yeah they're nothing alike no. they're so wildly different. They have a red breasts. Yeah. They must be similar. <laughs> <laughs> We're too lazy to come up with a new new name or busy surviving, I guess, was like their idea. But I, it is also really frustrating. And it, it's like, I hadn't thought it through until I had a friend. She had been, she'd like gone to England for something. And she came back and she said, like, I was there and I knew all the plants. And that made me, and she's like, and that made me so angry, Wendy, because all of those plants are here and they shouldn't be. And it was like, 
whoa, that did not even occur to me to think about. Like at that time, this was like, I don't know, I was, I was like, this is before I became a native plant. That's actually like maybe the beginning of my native plants journey. But, and it, it like just opened my eyes to like how plants were used to colonize this place in a way that it also colonized our minds to think about plants. Yep. Yep. And yeah, but the weird thing is, is that I've only been to England one time. Um, and I was like, I was in London and I went to the Natural History Museum and I'm waiting for my turn to get in and I look over and I was like, those are Oregon grapes. <laughs> like, ah, I got so excited. <laughs> uh, it, it is kind of hilarious because like many Pacific Northwest plants that like at the time here we're like oh, these are gross like your england was like these are the perfect things to plant as ornamentals yeah. yes more oregon grape yes <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a very interesting mindset like one well, i guess one person's trash or one person's trash plant is another person's treasure <laughs> right it's like when you now like people in in england are like we hate sitka spruce it is the worst tree on the planet they put it in the tree plantations and it like it's just like environmental apocalypse and then they come here and they're like are these even the same trees <laughs> it's amazing yeah. well it's yeah so they weird. grow very differently on the coast here <laughs> yeah yeah they're so magical i love them so much i had i had a similar epiphany um when I went to Ireland, because you think of Ireland like the sheep and the green rolling fields and meadows yeah. and stuff, but Ireland should be covered in trees. It should be a forest, right? And it's only that only looks like that. That's only our impression of it because they've all cut the trees down and now yeah. the sheep graze it. And the sh when the sheep graze, everything there's like nothing. They they, they yeah. graze everything to the ground. Oh, and so it's only I... it looks like that because of sheep, <laughs> right? Oh my gosh. Like I could read like George Mombiot's rage mm. against sheep like all day. Like he is like so passionate about like how horrible sheep are and like how they ruin everything. And I, yeah, his book Feral about like rewilding mm. and stuff mm -hmm. is like, oh God, it's so good. <laughs> he's, he's, he's written a lot of good stuff. Um, yeah. And it's, I mean, similar to sheep there are cows here because cows also, degrade the landscape and um and they have a big impact on streams that run through pastures. yeah yeah they they can be such um salmon killers yeah yeah and something else they don't really think about um yeah but, anyway. but yet also there's like great ways to like there are like amazing management techniques mm -hmm. that people can use to turn cows into a really good force for good since we are missing you know so many of our top level grazers right. like actually like keep those like grassland habitats rolling yep. along yep yep it's all about management proper management yes um yes so i wanted to ask you also about your um your role in editing because you you have to read through a lot of stuff right yeah a lot of submissions and so i wanted to ask you about um like are there any nature trends that you've seen or noticed um in horror writing like do people take bugs or plants or like what are the things that you see um frequently well you know part of it is very heavily influenced on like other market trends right mm -hmm. so like two three years ago there was like a new magazine called uh mermaids monthly mm -hmm. and uh it, Therefore, we got a ton of stories <laughs> that had originally been written for Mermaid Monthly that were then sent to us that had a lot of like sea horror going on. Um, so that, that's always like a, a kind of a, a recurring nature trend now, I think. Um, <laughs> but I feel like in general, like I don't, I don't really see stuff coming in trends so much as I think of like other people maintain there are. Um, and I don't know if that's because I haven't been open to submissions as often as I could be. Like I, this year I haven't read as many submissions because it's just been, had a lot of like, my family's had some health issues. I've had some health issues. I just, uh, and I, I have like a large stockpile of stories I already bought like last year. So 
Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I feel like I wish I had more like funny answers. Like, yes, it's all hilarious. It's all terrible spider <laughs> stories all the time. Or centipedes are the new it thing. But yeah, I feel like actually, I hate to say it, but I feel like nature is like a very, very minor occurring role that like shows up, which kind of makes me sad, right? Like, I feel like we write about what we think about, even if it's like what we're scared of, that those, I don't think people are thinking about nature as much as I would like them to. (laughs) Which is somewhat depressing. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Or maybe they're just all... Maybe everybody in horror right now just loves nature and doesn't want to like be <laughs> Vil- vilify it. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're like, what? No, we have three pet spiders. We're not going to write scary spider stories, or we've never read a scary story out in the woods because we want to go camping tomorrow. So maybe it's actually a win. Maybe people right, are right. super positive. <laughs> I remember this is a side note. I remember in um, the um, Hunger Games series. Oh right. There's the um, the forest and when the bombs are coming or whatever it happens that the the characters are trying to get the villagers or the the small town to go um into the forest and they're so scared of the forest because they've never been to the forest that they just they refuse to leave so they all ended up dying oh right i forgot about that (laughs) it was just and i thought about that a lot and then there's another bit where um where katniss goes swimming and it's no big deal you don't think about it until you realize that she only went swimming because she snuck out and nobody else in the the um what was it section 13 or whatever um, yeah was knew how to swim and like this is like the, the complete disconnect um and even in the like post-apocalyptic you know world where there's lots of nature but they were still so connect so so sheltered that they didn't have that connection to the forest or right. to, um, to water so I, I just i always think about that um right yeah 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 and i just watched this amazing documentary from Patagonia of all places. Uh, I mean, Patagonia, the company. Um, and the documentary was about a guy who's a professional surfer and he winds up, he wanted to go to this place, like it's off the shore of one of the like big national parks. And he thought it would be a great place to surf, but it's actually like the beaches were like covered with like, you know, fishing debris and was actually kind of horrible and he was like what's going on it's the national park and so you wound up connecting with like um a woman who runs she's an indigenous woman who runs like a like a a non-profit that tries to like help like protect fight road building in the national parks and in nature there and he wound up learning that like her people had like you know for like centuries and thousands of years they were like out swimming they're like the most famous like recognized divers like in like the southern hemisphere of of the americas and now no one in their community even though many of them are fishers none of them knew how to swim like that was something that like because they were like taken away from their families and put in schools or whatever like that was something that had just been like taken away from them so this professional surfer is like I will teach you to swim and like it was profoundly moving watching him teach them but it does it makes you think about the way that society kind of benefits from separating people from nature and it makes us easier to control it makes us less excited about taking care of the world it makes us more like we just want to sit and buy stuff and it's so bad for us and yet it's so beneficial to people who make money and yeah i'm just i'm just remembering right now that seattle parks we we usually have i don't know a dozen or more beaches that have um, lifeguards every year along the way only this year they like canceled half of them because they didn't have enough lifeguards or something so so now all these kids i mean are going to be swimming in pools inside instead of yeah. in the lake and you know in nature and being outside and um yeah I like that priority like let's prioritize pools inside but not the beaches outside right um yeah it's kind of depressing <laughs> yeah yeah and right now in portland like this year we're having like a lot of toxic algae built mm-hmm. like shoes like in local lakes and stuff and then 
like two weeks ago, they like announced that basically all of the Willamette from Portland to the mouth is now like not safe to touch. And it's like, oh, that's lousy. But yeah, it is really hard to swim in the Willamette in this area anyway. <laughs> yeah, a lot of it's channelized. Yeah, exactly. It's not very accessible. No, especially through downtown. <laughs> right yeah there is like it's cool there is a gr group i think called the river huggers and they're like committed to like going swimming every i don't know if it's every week or just once a month but they do like a, a big swim out there every every month it's kind of great the, we have the duwamish which <laughs> used to be bigger only they with the whole um restructuring of the city from mm. colonizers they, they um, connected and built the locks. And when they built the locks, the lake level went down, which dried up the Black River, and the Black River ran to the Duwamish, and so now oh. that doesn't exist anymore. And the Duwamish wow. now runs through the biggest industrial area in Seattle. And so it's basically a super fun site. Yeah. It is incredibly polluted. And they um, somebody from like the Nature Conservancy or something um, did a snorkeling down the length of the river. Oh, wow. <laughs> to illustrate like the pollution and the, the just like, the toxicity of it and wow. of course our our native tribe here is the the, the Wamish based off the yeah. river and um and it's just it's of course heartbreaking that the our one river in seattle is a super fun site because it's so cool. yeah um which is also very depressing and i think most people yeah. don't even know we have a river here i mean the willamette yeah. you can't miss because yeah they're like, like what like 10 bridges going over the willamette but <laughs> yes the, the the wamish is just kind of hidden away there and it ends up going through the port and um, yeah, it's a very depressing. That is really sad. That's so sad. Um, I feel lucky to live in Portland now because after, since like the late sixties has been a great deal of work put into mm -hmm. making the Willamette like better, right? Mm -hmm. Like it was definitely one of those rivers that was just the original sewer system just ran yeah. right into it. Yeah. Fish were just totally dead. I mean, it was just like terrible news. And it's like, there are like actually several cities upstream from us that actually do get their water from the Willamette. And it's it's very important to keep it clean enough for those communities to have something to drink. And it's like, <laughs> well, thank goodness they're putting in some effort here, you know, and yeah. <laughs> Better late than never. <laughs> right but past like in portland like once you get into north portland the river does there are some super fun sites that are mm -hmm. pretty refreshing so yeah um i wanted to go back and ask you um so you said that there weren't a lot of people using nature inspiration and horror at least in the, the short stories um which i don't want to say it's just like it's really sad because there's so many like horrific things right yeah <laughs> nature is just so creepy it's like magically creepy and gross like there is like no, no stone is left unturned for finding ways to get nutrients and energy out of a system, no matter what devastation it does. <laughs> it's so magical. Every time I read something, I'm like, God, that's horrific. That'd make a great horror story. I mean, like, or inspiration <laughs> for, you know, a creature yeah. or a, a subject or like, you don't have to even look very far. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, the invertebrate world alone is like, you could like, you could endlessly write, you could never run out of material. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. So that, that's definitely a goal for me is just to keep dry. I need to like dig into like more creepy nature stuff and just have fun with it. <laughs> I mean, like, like, yeah. Time to be done with like ghosts and werewolves mm. and stuff like that. And just really get in, embrace like my love of creepy invertebrate grossness <laughs> yes yes and like as the deep sea like the things we learned about the deep sea creatures right wow i mean so unsettling <laughs> I, I really like i know this is i mean i guess you could draw inspiration from anything but the um the um the squid versus the sperm whale you know like oh, right we don't know because it happens in the deep sea so we don't really know what happens like we know that the squid or the um whales eat the squid because we've seen the, squ the squid beaks in the whale's bellies Right. Um, and we know that the squids fight back because we've seen the whales with the tentacle scars on them. But, like, what happens down there? I want to know. Right? I really uh, want to know. It, I GoPros on all the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like, 
but I, I think I think that's a great inspiration for like somebody to write about. I mean, maybe not like exactly what happens, but using that you know as a model for like some sort of story of yes. like, sea creatures and. That sounds like fun. You're making the wheels turn in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. And there's, there's so many. There's so many. Like even in the nudibranch world, like there's, there's um, one species that I've seen not in person, but I've seen reports of it. That so all nudibranchs are hermaphrodites. So they mate at the same time. They they inseminate each other. And <laughs> there's there's one species, and I forget the name of it now. But while they're mating, they will. They're also cannibals. So talk about the biggest kink in the world. They will eat their mate while they're still mating. Wow. <laughs> and I've seen pictures of it and they actually like like they're they're still connected while the little ones in the big one's mouth. <laughs> wow. And they're like, how is that not somebody not like using that for inspiration to write stories? <laughs> that is amazing. Wow. Well, you should start writing horror stories, no. I think. <laughs> You're the perfect candidate. <laughs> I don't even read horror much. <laughs> yeah. I have to study up, I guess. <laughs> eh, it's easy. <laughs> I think. I think. What I, what I should do is like write a um, a naturalist guide to horror inspiration or something. That would be perfect. Yeah. yeah. I think Quirk Books would probably publish that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be fun to do. Like all the horrific things. Like yes. go wild with it. <laughs> yes. You would be like doing people in my world a huge favor. This. <laughs> That's a fun idea. I should write that down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I talked. I don't know. Do you know Gwen Katz, um, who's another author? Um, she was one of my guests early on in the in the show, and she had uh, contributed to. Um, oh no, I forgot the name. It was a, it was a um, anthology. I wish I remember the name of it now, but it was all insect horror anthology oh wow great but what i liked about it was she said it wasn't like people were like spiders killing everybody it was more the opposite it was like the spiders are the good guys and then the people Yay! are the bad uh, <laughs> and it, was just like, it wasn't like a conscious trend of people like the the, the organizers saying you know well you have to like make the bugs the good guys yeah it was just like the, just some, for some quirk people were just like i'm gonna write about you know the yes. bugs is the good guy so yeah i love that <laughs> I have found, like, this is, like, a broad generalization, and obviously they're, like, not everybody fits in. But in general, I have found, like, horror people are very, like, warm-hearted and happy and, like, they're really caring. And I feel like there's a lot of horror people just, like, yeah, like, they're... It makes sense that they would care for beings who are currently struggling a lot, right? Like insects are like having a hard time. <laughs> so they get this if they're like underdogs. Horror writers, yeah, like exactly. Underdogs. Yeah. yeah, they are now the underdog. Let's prove to them. The under beetle. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Um, so I have one final question. We've got about 10 minutes left. I wanted to ask you if you could think of any um, stories or books in the horror genre that have... Um, a significant or memorable nature element to them well i'd say one that comes to the top of my mind is the ritual by adam neville uh they adapted it into a movie on netflix which i don't think kind of captured as much as like the naturey elements of it but it's essentially it's a story about a group of men who are like on holiday together hiking in norway sweden scandinavia someplace a very rigorous hike and they have a lot of like scary experiences and they're very um yeah it's it's really really great read for that i'll have to look that one up yeah i would definitely put that on top of the list um for like dealing with gross invertebrates there's um there's a, a book called the troop by nick cutter and it involves scary invertebrates and boy scouts who are trapped on an island during a storm it's pretty gross i'm just gonna <laughs> warn you it is really gross like magically magically gross <laughs> um and then of course uh 
can't think of his name. Something Scott, Scott something. He had the movie. He has the, the book, The Ruins, um, which was also adapted into a film, but is like better as a book, which is about like American tourists visiting like, um, like ruins, like Mayan ruins in Guatemala. And there are very interesting plants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So those are some like ones that like are real standouts for like, either being really immersed in nature or having like natural creepiness. <laughs> uh, yeah. So those are the three that come to mind immediately. Okay. I know. I know you mentioned Jeff Vandermeer earlier. I don't know if he can oh. his horror or not. He's, He's kind of on the border, right? Like it's kind of weird literary science fiction, a little column A, a little column B, but I mean, like, yeah, his work is obviously extremely into it, it really involves nature right, so right yeah. i so this is another just side question <laughs> when people ask so I'm, I'm trying to write a novel about a pirate naturalist Yay! Um, and they're like what genre is it? i'm like i have no idea i don't know <laughs> i mean how do you like how do you define horror what like what makes it horror well horror can do a lot of different things um most of the time when we talk about horror, we're talking about work that is utilizing the tools of like dread, um, suspense, uh, and like maybe grossness to create and interrogate unpleasant states of being. Um, but horror can also overlap with like you know, despair and depression and uh, that like that sense of of not knowing our place in the universe and like trying to interrogate that um or just sort of strangeness and surreality so it can like it it can overlap with a lot of things and it usually is more of like a, a many times something could be categorized as a different kind of genre like there could be a book might be more science fictional but because of that use of like dread terror suspense you know that mounting tension pitting your 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 person against your characters against like a an outside antagonistic force that causes them great psychological and personal discomfort um a lot of times things that maybe started out more science fictional then become more horror ditto with fantasy ditto with like you know, it's, sometimes it's like, oh, is this book a thriller, which is more of like a action-y, but also still using those tools. Mm -hmm. Like they're often very horrible, intense, and like full of nastiness. Or it kind of just depends uh, a lot of times on where you think you can position the work and where you want to be positioned. <laughs> if you want to be on a shelf with Stephen King, co-op more of his elements, <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if that makes sense. I found for me, like, I, I started out and I thought I was going to be a fantasy writer. Um, I thought that was where my strength lied. But I found that everything I wrote had these darker, more horrific things. And then when I, like, I, I wrote, like, I have a science fiction novel. And a friend told me, oh, Wendy, after I read that one section, I had nightmares that <laughs> night. And I got so anyone had given me and I was like oh right yeah maybe I really should just focus more on on horror <laughs> uh, um, but I like horror I think like it, it gives us outlets and tools for like dealing with unhappy states mm -hmm. like but not a lot of other things in our world really allow us to explore. I kind of, sometimes I think like, it's kind of like a first aid kit for, or like a practice, like, you know, it gives you a chance to practice being scared. Right. Which we're so used to being so comfortable all the time that it's really nice uh, to have that, that chance to practice. I'm like a huge. That. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of my, perception of horror was just like the the, the slasher films you know, like just things that make you jump yeah which is just yeah like not always fun but like the, the more psychological deeper i like yeah 
I'm interested. Yay! Yay! <laughs> I love hearing that. <laughs> yeah, there's a huge world of horror mm -hmm. that we don't particularly I think because the way horror is marketed and the way it got marketed in the 1980s mm -hmm. with the success of like slasher films and the super like I think a lot of people aren't sure how they feel about horror or they think they have an idea about horror but they only have like an idea that's about this much horror mm -hmm. yeah yeah oh my gosh I forgot to tell you like probably one of the best nature related horror novels of like the last 10 years and that's the the only good indians by uh stephen graham jones which is about a group of men who poached an elk um well they poached elk plural and the elk find a way to get revenge on them <laughs> it's a tremendous novel that's really interrogating like what it's like being in the world as an indigenous person what it's like utilizing natural food sources what it's like dealing with social issues and what it's like to be scared like it's a powerful book but it kind of connects i think with like you know what we were just talking about yeah. with like how there's like like it's not it's it's been no it's it's like uh like juicy literary fiction and the fact that like you're reading like really deep character you're deeply absorbed into the, the character's world and you're like really engaging with your empathy and like your brain and it's not just like blood and guts and right. grossness and you know nobody's like chasing somebody with an axe it's like yeah it's amazing <laughs> well i'm going to the library website when i'm done here and put some books on hold <laughs> yay i i feel like i've had a huge success <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, don't, I, I never thought about it. i never thought about my perception of horror and why it was just like you know scream and yeah <laughs> or Chucky or whatever, those are not things that I like, so. <laughs> right, yeah. But no, you can definitely find horror that is like, yeah. you know, it's about all kinds, you can find any flavor of horror you want, like depending on what you're pining for at the time. There's so many really smart writers right now who are writing things that are very thoughtful about us and our place in society and like what is happening to us right now. And yeah, I think it's, like the best time to read horror right, movie right. ever. All right. Well, I'm sold. I'll, I'll um, yeah, go to the library. <laughs> Yay! The library. I love it. <laughs> well, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, Perfect. <laughs> I, I, my, my whole perception has been changed, and thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, that makes me so happy. <laughs> um, so thank you for joining us. This is so much fun. Um, it was yeah. terrific. Uh, yeah. I hope I get to see you around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. Um, hopefully I'll be down there in November. So Yay. yeah, yeah. And meet in person finally. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Goodbye. Bye.